everything you've said so far is exactly 100% in my opinion, dead on. I think you're 100% right with everything you've said. I really do. So the the opportunity that, that I'm you know, proposing to uh, young, talented people like yourself is you can build media for you know, Procter & Gamble and it can be gorgeous and intelligent and it'll have a division of labor and you'll have a lot of money to play with, but you're, you're living at a point where if you direct that talent towards education, number one, the, the growth in that industry is going to be 10 times what you're going to find in, for example, the advertising industry. They're going to go up 2% a year. We're going to go up 25. Absolutely. And also, you're not going to be pushing diapers. You're going to be building education, which you know, once we figure out how to do this, it's going to be distributed around the world, and it's going to have great social good attached to it. So I just wanted to make that, that fundamental pitch to you all to, to think about the, the tremendous opportunities and the value in thinking about education as a form of media and uh, what that might mean for, for you and your colleagues as you move forward in your careers. And I don't think either you or I went in this for the big paychecks, right? Into education? <laughs> yeah. Well, I did. I was just lied to. <laughs> Me too. Uh, I could not agree with you again more. I mean, I, I don't know. I thought. I think we've kind of, in our emails, have agreed numerous times over the past. I was at McGraw-Hill for years, and the reason why I went to McGraw-Hill is because I was successful in the sense of advertising, but, you know, not to be a superhero, I didn't want to use my powers for evil. I wanted to use my powers for good. So when I got a job, I got a job at an educational publisher and used my ability to do advertising and design to promote education. And then went on through just uh, serendipitous events into the world of academia. And there's a whole other story we all know, Keith, behind that as well. But... I think the most value whatsoever is in the distribution of educational materials today. We have the $100 laptop or a laptop for every child, you know, when Negro Ponte started, I believe, or the, the strength behind that. We need to spread education. If you want to democratize, probably not a real word because I'm, I should pay a syntax. If you want to actually spread democracy and humanism across the world, you need to spread education across the world. You need to bring everybody up to the level of the enlightenment and let the chips fall where they may. You know, we bring up issues of Nigeria, Sudan, Rwanda, Darfur, and, you know, we bring up the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and what they're trying to do. And, and here's a, you know, Warren Buffett. These people are trying. I believe they're actually trying. Uh, jobs I worry about at times, but I believe Wozniak and these people are trying. But uh, not that... Jobs cares if I worry. But I think your point is completely 100% right. First of all, the opportunities are going to be at leaps and bounds in the educational technology field. Assessment, teaching, branching out, distributing. I mean, it, but it has to be free. And that's where the rub is. How do we deal with this free distribution? Because we need salaries, right? And content distributors need salaries. So how do we deal with the free content mentality? What do we do here? I, I'm not a big fan of open content. I okay. Think, uh, I'm, I, I uh, you know, I, I, I was a, a, a neo-Marxist faculty member, <laughs> but the truth is I think the markets work to a large extent, and, and they're better at getting a lot of things done. I don't, you know, somebody's got to pay for this stuff. Yeah. And I also believe in competition, and so I'm, you know, I'm not a big fan of open content. As it stands right now, open content is built in that way that I described earlier, which is that cottage model. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, people are making it available for free, yeah. but it still is produced in that old fashion, which means really we're just pushing junk around. Yeah. And what we need to do is to figure out a business model that allows us to invest heavily and get our money back and distribute that content. I mean, not education is not 
an industry in which um, everybody has to have something different. There's a great deal of common content, common curriculum. Marketing 101 is taught at every single school. That content could be available for three cents per student. Yeah. Eventually per per institution. So I don't think we need open content. We need a commercial system that allows us to invest heavily, and we need to distribute those costs over as many users as possible. Absolutely. So our delivery method is definitely an issue, which obviously is here. Uh, we could have other forms of alternative revenue streams, which you know I look at Facebook, I look at Google, I look at MySpace, I look at all these areas, you know, Google Books, you know, what's going to happen here? Uh, the $125, $150 million lawsuit to them is a joke. We all know that, and they're more than just the cost of doing business. Pay $150 million to get all these books. Barnes & Noble just released 750,000 titles, right? I actually know Mitch Clipper, the CEO of Barnes & Noble. Not that he returns my calls, but I actually know his name. Uh, my point being is, there is, I come from the old textbook world, and I know that somebody's got to pay for this. You know, the question is, can we utilize alternative revenue streams, not the price per content stream, but alternative revenue streams to pay for this? You got a Facebook where kids are, my goal is to intertwine social media, e-learning, and content appropriate e-commerce at the right place. Okay. Now, my question everybody asks me is, what do I mean by content appropriate? Well, if I have a page on the Metropolitan Museum of Art or the San Francisco Museum of Art for the art students, and they're willing to subsidize that, a la the Chubb Group in Channel 13, there's an alternative revenue stream. Okay, it will bring people to the museum. They will learn more. It will pay for the museum, and it will pay for the spot. So we're a happy world there. Okay, if I get certain people to underwrite, let's use that term, certain sections that students are tremendously interested in. If you're a phys ed major and you want to study, you know, kinesiology, uh, why wouldn't there be a company that would sponsor a white paper series? Okay, and you have variables. You don't just have one because then they control the marketplace. Okay, so you got 10 different viewpoints coming to the student as an RSS feed where they can say who's real and who's not. So therefore the company has no control over what content is distributed. Okay, so I think there's a lot of different ways we can do this and then buddy it up or integrate it through directly with true academia where hopefully we're not tainted, you know, to speak from the corporate structure. So this combining of both things could keep us going, could give us a self-sustaining model. My biggest concern is stimulus packages running out. New York State is down 17% in tax revenue. And if they raise the county tax one more time down here on Long Island, they're just going to attack City Hall. Okay? So our three basic support systems in the public are done. Our three in the private, such as tuition, guys, you want to see a tuition raise? Yes or no? No, I don't think so. Uh, our endowments have been dec decimated by Wall Street. And fundraising is non existent because the people who would normally help us don't have any more money, except for Bernie Madoff. So there are areas here we have to think creatively about how do we redo this? What do we do? You know what I mean? Are the publishers going to help us, Keith? I, I wouldn't ask them. Hey. 